you to our Wisdom Wednesdays. So Wisdom Wednesdays is our endeavor to bring education, enlightenment, and resource to our uh, esteemed uh, guests here, to our students, corporates, and people from diverse areas. And we have taken adequate care to bring in very interesting speakers, presenting very interesting viewpoints, which are very relevant for us at this point in time. Uh, so Splitup is uh, a data analytics consulting and training institution. And we strongly believe we want to contribute as much to the community at this point in time. Once again, we welcome you all. And today's session is quite interesting. I'm sure I, I'm seeing uh, very interesting uh, uh, sessions coming up, very interesting uh, pertinent topics which are being addressed. And uh, we are also seeing a very uh, a similar or a repeat participants from our side. Before I get started for today's session, today's session is again a very, very pertinent topic in today's age, post-COVID learning landscape. How people learn and perform will change irreversibly. And I would, I'm very happy to have uh, our guest who will be the chief presenter for the session. I will give a brief note about it so that uh, he can get started. Uh, dear sir, thanks thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, Desi Kamani, sir, is My a pleasure. metallurgist mm -hmm. who out. Thank you, sir. So he is a metallurgist who found similarity in the way men and materials have behaved. Hence, became a and development professional. He has many methodologies and processes in learning and development. He has a company which focus on mentor learning, which is mentor.in, and his organization practices a unique approach called result-oriented learning engineering. His passion includes poetry, caricature, and he caricatures uh, happily and lives joyfully. And he also does executive coaching. So we welcome on board, and uh, we really are looking forward to a very thoughtful and insightful session. Uh, sir, before I hand over the stage to you, uh, may I request uh, a brief uh, a note to the participants here? Uh, dear participants, so you would see the chat screen here in the chat box. You could um, message us your inputs, views, suggestions, and you also see the, the question box to your left. So you could put in your questions at any point in time, and we will have our speaker uh, update you or you know answer the questions toward the end of the session i hope i'm clear uh, sir uh, over to you thanks a lot and we are looking forward to an amazing session thank you thank you namaste it's uh, technology is a wonderful thing and it's such a pleasure to connect with uh, brilliant minds from all over without even having to move an inch from where we are I always look at the internet as something that connects hearts. I'm sure most of you uh, are doyens and experts in learning, in HR, in business. Uh, above all, I'm sure you know all of you are people with you know much bigger common sense than I am. So it's such a pleasure, and you know, like uh, we always start with any uh, satsang. I bow before you. I think the space is the uh, sacred part of the whole thing. So namaste to all of you. Uh, whenever I think of learning, I cannot help but recite these three beautiful shlokas. Uh, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya, lead from darkness to light. Present light is in some way darkness, so it leads to newer light. Asatoma Sadgamaya. From untruth to truth, or lesser truth to a bigger truth, or the current truth to a different truth, whichever way you see it. And Mrityoma Amrudam Gamaya. There is death for the body, there is no death for the soul. So death to legacy. So I pray that all of us get 
all the three blessings that our Sanatana Dharma has treasured. So great, great to kind of have all of you here. Uh, please park in or write in your questions as we go along. I'm just leading the discussion and I will try and kind of close this in as short a time as possible, my monologue. And then, you know, we can probably have discussions. I will call in questions one by one. I hope that's uh, okay for a lot of you. And it's good to see a lot of people that uh, uh, I haven't interacted for a while, uh, uh, known to me. So it's, it's a pleasure reconnecting. Thank you very much. So my name is Mani. I run a company called Mentor Learning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a metallurgist who found men and material to be very similar and moved to dealing with the people side. Uh, today morning, I was uh, uh, kind of, you know, revisiting my notes on what I would possibly talk about. So what is it new that, you know, I can uh, 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 share to an August group of people? Well, it's not about me. I thought, you know, I will think aloud along with all of you and uh, try and uh, uh, possibly hypothesize, analyze, or dream about what is this post-COVID landscape going to be. And as I was preparing my notes this morning, I just sat with my newspaper, the Hindu, and a cup of coffee, and I looked, you know, at this beautiful article that Arun Myra wrote today morning in the Hindu, and this was about pathways to a more resilient economy. Uh, and, and he basically was trying to advocate or suggest what is going to be the way forward. And the first suggestion, he, he uh, very clearly spoke of seven possible suggestions. And I would like you guys to uh, Google this article uh, in the Hindu today in the op-ed page and read it. It's a beautiful article. Uh, the first suggestion that Myra kind of uh, spoke of uh, took my breath away. And I think I've been speaking about it in private circles for a long time. So he calls out, you know, GDP as a completely faulty metric of human growth. Uh, and, and it is unlikely to lead to a more resilient economy and a just society. How true. Uh, how do we really know if we are getting closer to the goal or objective of a just society and a resilient economy where people are happy? Now, now I mean, while it sounds esoteric, the, the thought took my breath away. And I said, if there is so much unknown, there are so many remarkably uh, uh, radical ideas, you know, that are coming about about the economy then I realized, you know, uh, there's so much that, you know, learning possibly can, uh, 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 can have in store for us. Uh, so therefore, I just began kind of thinking about what it could be. And here I am. Okay, I'm going to articulate my uh, uh, thoughts. Let me share my screen more as a, uh, as a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, pointer so that I don't miss stuff that I wanted to share today. So let me uh, start, you know, sharing uh, my uh, screen here. So as I was reading uh, Arun Myra article, I, uh, I saw something there and I decided to do a quick cartoon. And interestingly, this lockdown made me a cartoonist from absolutely no cartoons to probably drawing a cartoon once every 15 minutes, I, I realized that it was a great uh, skill building opportunity. Uh, so this uh, Corona, Corona apparently means a halo or a, or a kind of ring of light. So I wonder in this COVID Maya, where is light? Uh, uh, man kind of moving from, I don't know where to I'm absolutely sure he will get back to, you know, where he was, or even a better uh, situation. Uh, 
in fact uh, there's this guy called fridge of capra uh, who became very popular is a quantum physicist who saw a lot of parallels with the eastern mysticism and uh, uh, capra very beautifully captures this in his book called systems view of life along with pierre luigi luzzi uh, he says only humans have the ability to imagine and evolve new concepts and that largely is what uh, 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 you know differentiates them so i have hope i'm an eternal optimist and i'm sure you know we will learn differently we will learn in a very interesting way because we know how to survive and we know even how to manipulate this environment so i'm very hopeful so on that note i wanted to start off okay uh, somewhere i think uh, you need to go to the basics you need to go and take a look at uh, so where it all began if you look at the evolution of learning there are some stunning facts i unearthed or discovered how many of us would have thought of the fact that more than 83 84% of kids in this world are being privately educated paid for you know by their parents completely and not by the government in fact historically learning has been a very private affair it has been uh, something you know where there were you know small groups of people learning and then eventually families taught kids you know how to become better or how to survive and you know how to make a living uh, education was largely in the family it was only the elite who went to schools and learning was hardly institutionalized and that's how it was all through till the 17th century end of the 17th century and something very interesting happened and i read this you know in a in a beautiful book called evolution of everything by matt ridley ridley is uh, apparently a nobel uh, nominee uh, a geneticist okay and now uh, uh, in the house of lords in uh, london so ridley recalls this uh, story about you know how learning evolved and i'm going to share the story very quickly so in 1806 this short fellow called napoleon uh, invaded prussia the modern germany and defeated them prussians were very proud and they thought they were the most technologically superior army and they couldn't digest the defeat is that how can these lazy uh, species called french you know defeaters who are the most systematic and blah blah so they went and asked you know their uh, uh, one of the leading intellectuals of their time uh, a guy called uh, william von humboldt so they asked humboldt you know why did we get defeated and humboldt said uh, in a matter of fact tone look if you have too many free thinking people in your society and that's what your private education does how do you expect to win wars wars require donkeys and mules and you know people who comply and the prussians were taken aback so they said how do we do what do we do this what do we do about this and uh, humboldt made three very simple suggestions he said look educate a generation of your kids differently and you will win most wars and they asked him how and he said very simple i can think of three basic things do not allow a kid to learn anything deep number 1 number 2 don't let the child decide what he or she would learn at any point in time so maybe make small periods and let the teacher decide what the child learns and keep changing it and the third he said maybe you should use an icon something like a bell to indicate to the child that you know we are deciding what he or she would learn now i'm sure you can recall all the schooling that we went through even college education was more or less on this terms you know we never decided what we learned and so on and so forth so learning predominantly in the 18th century evolved okay into an act of conditioning an act of preparing okay to make people behave in predictable ways 
and that was thought to be the sustainable way and eventually you know this whole idea uh, uh, worked on and by 1830 Russia waged war against France and defeated them comprehensively so proof of concept here and this was watched carefully first got exported to the North Carolina public schooling system and around 1850s the big colonizers of that time the British and the French took it on okay and made it into a global concept and we are still reeling under its impact now that is how we box learning learning is school learning is college learning is during a period uh, uh, beyond that whatever happens is uh, fringe and so on and so forth and I also ask myself this question, what do we really mean by learning? Learning encompasses, uh, in my opinion, too many verbs uh, uh, and, and probably uh, it is used, you know, too subjectively and uh, based on convenience. Uh, but the three key verbs, you know, that comes to me uh, are, is it knowing, is it behaving or is it leveraging? These are the three verbs that I see are maybe one leads to the other. Uh, but which is it that we call as learning has always been a, uh, 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 you know, nagging question in my mind. In fact, when I, when I thought I could engineer learning, uh, uh, this question was the most nagging thing of all. And to me, learning actually seems to be uh, about leveraging, about producing outcomes. Uh, if we cannot produce outcome, whatever it is, okay, so I will not go into, you know, what those outcomes are. But if you want outcomes and, you know, you can get ready for that, that is learning. And that's how I define it. And I'm going to talk about learning in that context from now on. Because that, I think, is the only, uh, uh, the one and only useful way to learn. There are philosophical undertones to learning. So one becoming a contented, contented, happy, uh, uh, deep and uh, uh, empathizing, sensitive individual and so on and so forth. If that's the outcome, so be it. So uh, uh, that's how I see learning. Now, uh, in the last about 20 odd years, uh, there are very, very strong scientific foundations that we get from neuroscience which uh, helps uh, study the brain and therefore, you know, gives us uh, both a phenomenological uh, a process outlook and a mechanical outlook to this idea called learning. Uh, so briefly, uh, unlike the computer, which takes one input, processes it with a single processor and gives one output, the human brain is complex. Uh, it has two processors, the amygdala, which is the limbic brain or reptilian brain, and uh, cortex, which is the really evolved aspect. And Frijov Capra's statement that human beings are the only species that can imagine can be attributed to the cortex. Cortex is a more recently evolved uh, 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 organ in the human body. And... Uh, uh, the, the stunning uh, aspect that actually most people don't realize about the human brain is that even though the cortex is the more evolved, more sophisticated uh, part of the brain, which can process uh, uh, significantly better the inputs, uh, nature has still kept the veto power of decisions with the amygdala which is a very simple, is it safe, is it not safe kind of a single switch. Uh, so if the behavior according to amygdala is safe, it is allowed. And if the behavior according to amygdala is unsafe, new, could be dangerous, is not allowed. So all the knowing, all the analysis, all the imagination does not translate to behavior and hence leveraging unless the amygdala is convinced. Now that is the neuroscience way of defining learning. If you want to be relevant, if you want to be contextually valued, 
then I think you need to have the ability to leverage whatever it takes, okay, to produce that value which makes you contextually relevant and valuable. And, and that power, unfortunately, or fortunately, still lies with the amygdala. So the almond-sized, small, little corner, you know, just above the hypothalamus, below the middle oblongata, seems to be the controller of our destinies and behavior. And what does the amygdala respond to? Now, if you look at it, uh, fear is the survival emotion that nature has built into us, a kind of a safety mechanism. If you don't experience fear for a full day, well, you won't survive a full day. In 20 minutes, I'm sure you will be dead. Some of you who look at, you know, your, your boss or your spouse and feel like whacking them uh, every now and then, it is, these, it is the fear that makes you not do it and survive, okay? And, and uh, therefore, that's the survival emotion, safety mechanism. And historically, if you look at it, you don't need to go and read any book. All you need to do is to take a 15, 20 minute reflection of your life over the last two, three months. What have you learned? Uh, what is it that, you know, you have got as a leverage now? That is therefore conquering some fear and habituate to the new normal. I saw withdrawal symptoms in people early on when the lockdown happened. And I see that, you know, people are absolutely used to it. And it took just about six weeks for people to become comfortable with what they were doing. And the anxiety slowly goes down. Of course, new anxieties will emerge and come on. So I just wanted to therefore, you know, reinforce. Uh, 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 this is the optimist in me, which wants to remind me. Only humans have the ability to imagine, evolve new concepts. On and off, once a while, a Corona, a COVID, uh, a, a SARS-CoV-2 can come and test you. But I'm sure we will overcome and we will move on. And, and with that context, I, I, I want to go ahead and, you know, talk about some thoughts I have in terms of, you know, what could be some post-COVID scenarios. Uh, the more I thought about it, I could recall or kind of think about five. Now, in the last three, four years, there was enough indication that it is going to be a gig economy. And I'm absolutely now sure post-COVID that gig economy will flourish. And gig compensation will be the norm. Shift is going to be, uh, there's going to be a big paradigm shift in the basis of compensation from activity or loyalty uh, to value generated. And I'm sure they will find, you know, newer and newer ways of compensating people for uh, a clear value that, you know, is being generated. And people are not fools. Uh, people have begun adapting. Okay, so if you look at the number of orange or maroon or green t-shirts, you know, that keep flying on motorbikes here and there, uh, or the Ola Uber, uh, you're very clear that the gig economy is here, you know, to come to stay. So the second uh, trend that I see is uh, there is a clear shift, you know, from employee to solopreneur. Uh, people will recognize that it is eventually some kind of a trade in skills, materials or services. In a sense, everyone will believe that he's selling his value and none else will get him the value that he wants to survive. Uh, I, I, I recognize that, you know, there is a philosophical realization of this for a long time, but a material realization and a behavioral adaptation of this is going to be speeded up post COVID. Uh, I have no doubts about it. Third, there will be no more forced learning. Uh, certificates will start losing value, but skills will become valuable as contracts will become value-based instead of time-based. I'm not really sure how this is going to pan out, okay, in terms of, uh, 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 from a structural perspective, maybe there could be a lot of school dropouts as the West experienced at one point in time. Uh, 
uh, people are going to stagger their learning uh, instead of uh, from kindergarten to a master's or a PhD at one go, I will see a lot of staggering, you know, on a going basis. Uh, the next uh, uh, most important thing that I see is going to be uh, ownership for learning is going to massively shift from organizations and entities to the individual. Uh, individuals are going to very clearly buy learning that they want or access learning that they want, which is leverageable. Uh, hence, I believe learning will become number one, bite size smaller, number two, highly contextual, leverageable, number three, self-paced, and number four will be trial driven. Uh, if there is no trial available, then I don't see that as learning is what people are going to say. Knowledge is going to be either free, available uh, for the take. Uh, Google has already demonstrated it. Wikipedia has demonstrated it. YouTube has demonstrated it. Look at the number of, uh, 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 if not five star, two star, three star chefs that have emerged in every home. Look at the way things are getting garnished. Look at the variety that people cook. How is that possible? So knowledge is not really going to be the thing. So learning is going to be looked at seriously and bought unless, not going to be bought unless it is trial driven. The last and to me the, the most important thing is going to be Attention spans are going to be the biggest challenge. In the last six months, uh, in any conversation, I have not seen anyone who could stay away from the mobile phone for more than probably 30 seconds. Uh, some very disciplined people, 60 seconds. Uh, and the social media growth demonstrates comfort with faceless expression. This is going to be very critical for all of us to recognize. Uh, people want to learn in private. Uh, people want to learn in non-threatening spaces and privacy and non-threatening environments where trial is going to be available and technology will enable very interesting forms of trial. Uh, again, this is not a new idea. Uh, wherever we realized, okay, the costs are high of failure or costs of non-compliance are high, such as training pilots to fly planes uh, or nuclear plant operators to operate their plants. We've already, you know, gone to the simulation way. Uh, so you make pilots uh, fly or uh, nuclear plant operators operate a certain number of hours in simulation without failing before they are even allowed to do things. So simulation based learning, uh, um, which is private, which is non-threatening, uh, is going to probably become the norm really. And uh, uh, so therefore, where is this going to take us really? Uh, going forward, I, I see some very interesting things happening. Uh, I actually want to share a story which, which, I, which is a favorite of mine. I've shared in many places. So this is a story about Mullah Naziruddin, uh, the, the uh, character like Birbal that we've all you know, been used to uh, at some point in time. Uh, so the Mullah uh, wanted to help uh, some people in a village, you know, uh, see sense in not being short-sighted. So he wanted to show them how stupid they are. And therefore, what he did was uh, he came out of his home uh, in the evening when the light was fading away. And under the street light, he started furiously searching. Mullah being the Mullah, the respected guy, a lot of people stopped by and wanted to help him. And they started searching along with him. After a few minutes, someone had the sense to ask the Mullah, so, um, can you tell me, what did you lose? And Mullah said, I lost the ring that I was wearing and he described it. So, people started searching. It was what? It was probably a thousand square feet of space and 40 people searching and they couldn't find it. And people began tiring, you know, within minutes. 
So after about 20 minutes, you know, someone had the courage and, you know, the sense to come and ask the mullah, uh, mullah sahab, so where did you lose the ring? And mullah said, I lost it in my kitchen. And uh, people got flabbergasted. So they said, then why are you searching here? So he said, what do I do, my dear? I don't have light in my kitchen and I see only light in the street. And is it not important for the world to know that I'm searching for what I lost? So there is the lesson. Uh, um, I think going forward, there will be an increased tendency to start searching where we lose things and not where we see light. Learning will become less of a ritual and people will start seeing where they lost things and start searching there, unlike Mullah Nasiruddin or like him. Second, uh, in the last, you know, five to ten years, if you really go and look at any science, there is no such thing called pure science. Or look at any discipline, okay, even humanities. There is no such thing called, you know, pure siloed or denominated disciplines. Everything seems multidisciplinary. And I, I think uh, vocations, roles, industry, all of them will become multidisciplinary in nature and therefore... Being solopreneurs, people will want to optimize their lives, optimize their value, and they would want to start doing what they're also enjoying while they are doing, and therefore multidisciplinary learning will be the norm. Learning will be contextual, only contextual, focusing on leverage, and it will be forgotten quickly. There will be no uh, uh, nostalgia and uh, possibly... Uh, the old world charm of, you know, hey, uh, that's important, this is important, tradition, ritual, may not be the norm. Uh, people will learn in the short term, leverage it, be bored about that skill and will not want to kind of spend time on that and necessarily build expertise. A very, very tiny group of people will want to uh, uh, build expertise. Reliance on tools, guides and tech enablers will increase. In fact, learning will not be seen as what you know or can do, but the ability to use what you know quickly. So the ability to use technology to, uh, to achieve outcomes and therefore use of tools, uh, creative use of tools, you know, will become the norm really. And creativity and ideas will be the premium. Uh, the future is going to be about ideas. The future is going to be about creative use of ideas and employee value will be hugely determined by that and not merely by consistency and predictability. In fact, the more consistent and predictable the job you do, your compensation might actually be going down by the year or your job will be at stake because AI is likely to replace you. And I am sure there will be increasing school college dropouts. There will be a lot of shifts in career choices, particularly mid-career choices. And I think individuals will invest in learning lifelong. My personal experience in the last uh, uh, five weeks, from one of uh, denial to confusion to anxiety to excitement, and I'm in the process of converting my company from a highly physical instructor-led learning company to practically a complete digital learning company. And I'm enjoying the process. Uh, I'm sure each one of you will see a lot of what I'm talking about here and more. This is only my thinking aloud. Obviously, this is not so much based on, you know, some study or uh, if you ask me for references, I will just say, go jump. I don't have anything. So this is just perspective and wisdom. And here I am. So I would like to take some questions. Yeah. Uh, amazing, sir. Uh, thanks again. I think uh, your session was very interesting, inspiring. So let me help uh, you with the first question, sir. Amar Dinda here has the first question. What yeah. are your views on experiential learning? Come again. Uh, what are your views on okay. experiential learning? All right. Uh, I actually want to be sarcastic here. 
If it is not experiential, it is not learning. <laughs> now, uh, uh, obviously, if it is not experiential, it could be knowing. Uh, it is not learning. Oh, in post-COVID world, uh, Colonel, uh, uh, I see you uh, raising a follow-up question. In post-COVID world, there will only be experiential learning. I may have made that point. One of the significant trends that's going to be is, don't tell me things, okay? Uh, give me an opportunity to try them and I will decide whether what you're suggesting is worth it or not worth it. In general, the attention spans are going to be there. Uh, oh, please, uh, Chandra, go ahead. Please ask the question. Go ahead, Chandra, please. Ah, here it is. I'm projecting the question to everyone. Which skill is going to win in the post-COVID world? Well, uh, uh, tough one, really, Chandra. But I will uh, stick my neck out and answer it. I think the biggest skill is going to be common sense. Uh, the intelligence... Uh, the intelligence to uh, uh, identify priorities, the intelligence to uh, convey things in a way other people can uh, 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 appreciate what you are saying, uh, and, and most importantly, empathize, to be able to see things from another's point of view and not waste time uh, of other people, uh, because it's going to be a world which is going to be bloody cautious, uh, which is going to not value anything that, you know, seems to be of value to them. And people are going to be on the fly in a hurry and they are going to be, you know, uh, 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 running quite a bit, uh, even though they don't know where. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, we request you to type your question in the box because I'm not too sure we are able to enable uh, the, uh, the mic. Yeah, I'm able to, yeah, correct. I'm able to see the questions. I will answer one by one. I'll project the question and answer that. Uh, well, this is a brilliant question. And I thought, uh, I thought I gave you my view about it. See, learning is going to be largely digital because only digital can create privacy and non-threatening spaces. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, obviously, digital learning will not curb, but will hugely enable avenues for experiential learning. Go back to my example on uh, how pilots have been learning to fly planes without actually sitting in one. Uh, so that's going to be the norm. Uh, new simulations are going to be the order of the day. Uh, everything, even the softest thing. For example, if you want to teach your child uh, how to behave with guests, uh, there will be simulations for that. Uh, instead of you doing role playing like earlier, you would actually get the child to try it and then you would probably quietly watch from the side, okay, and encourage. This, uh, uh, so Shiva is asking, uh, uh, what's your view on our culture given the gig economy? Well, it has been transforming quite a bit. Uh, uh, loyalty is already, you know, the done thing. Uh, in fact, when I when I did a study of employee lifespans uh, uh, between uh, 97 and 2007, in 97, uh, old economy businesses had a 13-year lifespan on an average, uh, employee joining and quitting. Uh, the new economy had about 47 months. Uh, by 2007, that number uh, had already dropped, okay? Old economy businesses had dropped down from roughly 13 years to four years, and uh, old economy had dropped to some two odd years. Uh, and, and I didn't do it in 2017, but you can see the trend, okay? So therefore, the gig culture is going to be a value-driven culture, loyalty-less culture. Uh, if you can engage people, uh, uh, 
show them value and show them meaningfulness uh, then you have them with you but there will be people available to replace uh, so uh, the the gig is going to be the in thing uh, one second. So the next one uh, I hear is Manjunath is asking, uh, Google has already made the mind dull. Would artificial intelligence make it dull further? Uh, well, I disagree with you, Manjunath. Uh, uh, why has Google made the mind dull? Google has made the mind fresh and alive for use of knowledge rather than trying to remember and recall and work with knowledge. Uh, 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 today, I don't uh, uh, bother to remember uh, lyrics of a song that I want to produce. In two clicks, I find the lyrics and I find a karaoke and I sing, okay, and enjoy. So I think, you know, Google is for the good. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would recommend a, a Nobel Prize, you know, if there were one available for organizations. My first choice goes to Google. It has completely changed, you know, and made all of us alive. Uh, well, uh, uh, let me, uh, uh, there is a question from Chandra, Chandra Shekhar Kaluri. I'll project this. Uh, what socio and academic changes will we have to make to make this a smooth journey? Oh, okay. Brilliant. I think, uh, I would like to quote Khalil Gibran who spoke about children. Uh, Gibran said beautifully, he said, they are not made of us or for us. They are merely made through us. You can own their body and nurture it for some time, but never their soul. So I think, you know, the biggest mind shift that one has to do socially is to start believing that people are independent and they make their decisions. And the biggest mind shift that one has to do is not to control or push, but always to pull and engage. Uh, so the challenge is going to be in your ability to influence, ability to persuade, ability to create environments. That is going to be the biggest challenge of the century. And I saw another question about what's the role of managers now. And uh, Shiva asked that question, and my answer is the same. The role of managers is to stop supervising, to stop focusing on controlling and ensuring, and start focusing on creating environments. And the future is going to be one of self-managed workspaces. Uh, which one skill we need to learn and unlearn? Good question. The skill I told you, uh, learn is going to be Common sense, sensitivity, empathy, and adaptation. You combine all of that into one skill. Unlearn a belief that hierarchies will work. Hierarchies are not going to work. Uh, what new habits and beliefs will one need to gain or inculcate post this scenario? I think you have to, Venkatesh Santanam is asking that question. It's a very good question. Uh, you have to start working backwards from what you want uh, and call out the skills and value that will help you achieve what you want and focus on that. Uh, you have to prioritize. Uh, that is going to be, again, the biggest challenge. Uh, by the time you take your long term to perfect something, uh, you may probably have missed the window. Will homeschooling increase? That's another wonderful question. Of course, yes. Uh, Chennai, uh, I don't think Zoom is the homeschooling really. Zoom is the school coming to the home. That's not what I see as uh, homeschooling. Uh, I see homeschooling as where parents take charge of the learning completely. Parents create environments, you know, uh, consolidate resources, aggregate resources, and help children learn and flower on their own. That's homeschooling. And for your information, Chennai is already the homeschooling capital of the world. Uh, what will be the role of uh, L&D professional? That's a good question. 
Well, I don't know. The L&D professional, uh, uh, no offense meant to them. Uh, L&D professionals, by and large, have been aggregators and coordinators. Uh, they have uh, tried to kind of piece things together. Uh, my feeling is uh, uh, L&D will merge, you know, hugely with the HR function, with both the uh, HR generalist or a business HR role and L&D will all combine together. And a lot of mundane tasks of these roles are going to be uh, automated. So the real value addition of this role is going to be to advise contextually and help people choose to do the right things rather than monitoring and commenting on whether they are doing whatever stupid things they are doing right. Uh, that's my view on this. Uh, uh, well, uh, do I see something else? Neera Bindra is asking, what are some new ways we can leverage our learning post COVID? I think I've answered that question. You need to keep looking out and, you know, learn on the fly. Uh, working from home is going to continue uh, to remain post uh, uh, COVID. And I see that. How do you see this? There has to be a big shift in people management and project management. I think the answer lies in how the economy is going to shape up. It's going to be a gig economy. So accountability is, will be built in contracts. Uh, people know that their survival dep depends on delivering uh, accountable performance. So, in fact, uh, working from home will only be enabled or can be enabled unless contracts become uh, tighter. You cannot supervise people working from home. Uh, more than whether people are delivering or not, it will result in a lot of uh, ugly interpersonal conflicts, you know, which will border on the personal domains. So, I think, you know, uh, people management and project management are going to be more by design rather than through execution. Uh, what will be the role change of L&D professional? I think I answered that. Will the digital learning focus more on leverage? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, digital knowledge has already given us access to knowledge as and when we need on demand. So digital learning, and please recall how I defined learning right up front. That's going to focus completely on leverage. Uh, well, uh, 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 whether the organization invests or not, even today, if you look at it, the organization is not investing for charity. The organization is investing only in areas that they believe and they prioritize as something that will help. Uh, that scenario will continue, except that, you know, the uh, platform will shift from, you know, physical to uh, digital. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be uh, 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 continuing there. Uh, employees will begin to invest more. And that's what I called out in my last slide. Uh, well, dig uh, digital learning, uh, will, will that hit the empathy part? Uh, is someone trying to ask me something? Okay, I will go ahead and answer as many questions as I can. Um, Uh, uh, while the future is uh, digital learning, will that hit the empathy part? How to overcome uh, uh, for training module designer and trainees? I think we will adapt to the new thing. For example, uh, I don't know if in this session empathy is lacking. Uh, given the constraints, uh, uh, um, the one who teaches has to become more empathetic to be able to anticipate and sense and work. Will entrepreneurship increase? Absolutely. Uh, if yes, how? Uh, well, uh, all the squeaky wallas and you know the Uber wallas have already given you the answer. Uh, they are all entrepreneurs, uh, and 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 some of them are happy for doing that because they're making a lot more money than being stuck in a full-time job. Uh, well. Uh, I think I have, well, I've answered this question and uh, uh, role of managers. Uh, 
Yes, I think I have answered all the questions that that have come about. Yeah. Uh, so, are we done? Uh, sir, one one last question which came about. Uh, so, what is your take on specialist versus general general role? Okay. Uh, you know, I've been studying this, you know, over the last uh, three decades. Okay, I would say three and a half. Okay, if I can add my college days. Uh, there has never been a, uh, a one, uh, there has never been a, 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 you know, a needle shift, you know, towards one way, specialist or generalist. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, any entity, the pyramid, uh, is going to kind of become flatter, but the pyramid will exist. Uh, I don't think, you know, everyone can get to do special jobs. Uh, all of us have uh, uh, a lot of generalist parts uh, in our jobs and uh, some special part in our jobs. So uh, there will be a certain proportion of specialists who will continue to rule the roost, but it will all be generalists but in narrower and narrower domains. So in that sense, you could say the shift will be towards generalists, uh, towards specialists. Uh, there's a question on layoffs in India. Well, <laughs> everyone is going to conserve cash. Uh, everyone is going to uh, ruthlessly call out and tell people who do not have a role that they do not have a role. Uh, so, therefore, some layoffs will happen. Uh, but uh, historically, if you look at evolution, uh, someone who has been rendered irrelevant in the current context will sure find his or her relevance if the attitudes are right. Uh, there is no such thing that you will do only one job. In fact, as I uh, made a prediction earlier, uh, one of the things that is going to be is that uh, so people ask me, you know, so I started in manufacturing, I then moved to kind of sales, then I moved to a slightly larger form of sales, then I moved into training and consulting, then I kind of became an entrepreneur. So people ask me, so how do you make those shifts? These will become the norm. I see people, for example, uh, uh, from uh, full-time uh, programmers to software programmers to full-time musicians, filmmakers, and I already see it happening in the under 30 age group all the time. So uh, uh, that's going to be the norm. Will ILT be continued by corporate for senior level training or mid-level? Well, instructor-led training is uh, uh, has a very unique purpose. Uh, it creates, you know, uh, a certain kind of impact and engagement if done well. And therefore, it will be used, but it will be used less and less. It will not be used very clearly for a lot of mundane things that hitherto or so far it has been used for. That's my view on that. So someone says I'm working in engineering industry as purchase officer. It will be difficult to get credit. Any special skill to learn and convince supplier in this situation? <laughs> Good question, Balan. But, uh, um, you know, this... Uh, this test has been uh, there for purchase uh, uh, or commercial professionals uh, every now and then. Uh, when the internet was not available, uh, people had to rely on smaller number of suppliers and they couldn't really locate people. And therefore, the suppliers had a leverage and they could therefore, you know, operate at lesser credit. But the moment... Uh, internet came and you know there was many many people available many suppliers available uh, automatically the 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 buyer became the king so the buyer started uh, uh, um, you know uh, controlling the uh, transaction and therefore you know he got more credit he had to be given more credit but it's going to be a question of demand supply situation the uh, uh, the skill that you would probably need here is to understand what are the leverage points that you have with the buyer or the supplier. 
okay uh, uh, so if you can for example sometimes uh, uh, creating a perception of long term security uh, uh, may get you uh, better credit uh, and and so on and so forth so i'm sure you know if you think harder you'll be able to find uh, better uh, opportunities uh basavaraju is asking what is the future for microfinance industry uh well microfinance industry is going to be one of the industries that will adapt faster to digital learning because it's very expensive to reach the kind of people uh, in fact i've had some wonderful uh, experience in the microfinance industry uh mobile phone is going to be the uh, biggest platform through which you will educate both uh, employees as well as customers and in general uh, given the uh, nature of both customers and employees in microfinance who are from the lower strata of the society uh, they will be far more happier uh, taking up digital learning which is leverage based and not knowledge based because they've always been scared of and intimidated by theoretical knowledge and conventional training methods uh is there anything else that uh, uh we have oh it's 1 minute to 6 o'clock i don't know how time flew uh thank you very much uh i will be very happy to receive uh, feedback uh Uh, and and um, well that's about it if there are no more questions then i would like to kind of call it off radhe krishna namaste thank you very much